Hello, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for the Mental Health Disparities and Marginalized Groups panel this afternoon. My name is Chris Shin, and I am an Associate Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, as well as the Director of the VCU um, Humanities Research Center's Health Humanities Lab. I'm also the Scholar Administrator of the Office of Health Equities History and Health Program. The Health Humanities Lab fosters interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research collaborations that center on better understanding and critiquing the systematic and structural inequities that produce health and healthcare disparities and on imagining and enacting alternatives. We welcome your participation in our monthly meetings, um, including our last meeting this, sem this semester, which is on, on May 5th. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like to join us and we'd love to have you. Today's conversation has been organized as part of an online history and health educational module on mental health disparities in mar marginalized groups, being designed by undergraduate Health Humanities Lab undergraduate fellows as part of the History and Health's Equitable Access to Care series. It will be recorded and posted on the module, which will include readings and reflection questions on, on um, mental health. The history and um, the, his, the Health Humanities Lab, sorry, so many um, H's, would like to thank the Director of the Humanities Research Center, Christina Stanchu, Communications and Administration, um, Administrative Assistant, Ronnie Sisaveth, Logan Vetrovich in the Office of Health Equity, History and Health Program, and Scott Bruniger, Dean of the Honors College, for enabling um, fellows this semester to engage in research opportunities um, and for bringing together this panel. We would also like to thank the panelists for making the time to meet with us. I know this is a very busy time of year. Um, I'll briefly introduce each of them and then have the um, Health Humanities Lab undergraduate fellows introduce themselves, and then the students will facilitate the, the panel discussion. Uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat at any time, and then the panelists will address them during our question and answer period at the end of the um, panel discussion. So I'll just go in alphabetical order um, and then turn everything over to the um, students. So beginning with Dr. Um, Jihad Aziz. Jihad Aziz is the Executive Director of University Counseling Services at BCU and a licensed clinical psychologist. Dr. Aziz's clinical interests include training and supervision, conflict mediation, community violence, multiculturalism, African-American men's issues, and leadership development. Next, we have uh, Dr. Mackenzie Green. Mackenzie Green is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work and an IQ scholar at BCU. Her research focuses on how racial and family processes can be leveraged to foster healthy development and well being among Black identified youth in the United States. Dr. Rochelle Hayes is an associate professor of psychiatry at BCU and a licensed clinical psychologist. Dr. Hayes's expert is in preventative and behavioral medicine, particularly in tobacco control physician training in providing behavioral health care, and weight management counseling obesity. Dr. Oswaldo, um, Oswaldo Moreno is an assistant professor in the psychology department at VCU. Dr. Moreno's research involves understanding and addressing health equity and health care disparities and inequalities in the U.S. that affect individuals from racial, ethnic, minoritized backgrounds, especially the Latinx, Latin, Latin, Latine um, immigrant, and Spanish-speaking communities. Um, Brooke Taylor, welcome Brooke, um, is a Black, queer, non-binary social justice advocate and scholar who is dedicated to serving marginalized communities. Brooke is a proud Bison, Howard University, Panther, VUU, and RAM, VCU, alone, um, and a wonderful colleague in gender, sexuality, and women's studies at VCU. So welcome again, and thank you to the panelists um, for joining us today. The undergraduate Health Humanities Lab fellows um, who are working on the mental health disparities in marginalized groups module will now introduce themselves. Thank you, Dr. Shim. Good morning, everybody. My name is Rome Kamarautu. I'm a sophomore at VCU, majoring in financial technology and minoring in psychology. Uh, my research in this project mostly focused on stigma and criminalization of mental health. We also have uh, Jayla Davis. She is a senior majoring in African American studies at VCU and minoring in psychology. And her research focused on social and behavioral perspectives of mental health. And finally, we also have Abir Tehran. She is a junior majoring in interdisciplinary science and has a minor in psychology. And she focuses on research on public policy within mental health.
Thank you, Rome. So hi, everyone. My name is Avir. And to start us off, we thought we'd share with a general discussion about some main focuses of our topic. Can anyone give us context about the BIPOC community and mental health? People from racial and ethnic minoritized groups and are disproportionately misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed for mental illness and are disproportionately targeted for criminalization and incarceration. Can you discuss how and why this happens? Sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure who was going to go first. So I'll, I'll just say some things and then people can just, you know, jump in. Um, you know, thanks for having me here. I, I appreciate it. I, you know, I think when you talk about misdiagnosis and um, underdiagnosed um, for a BIPOC community, it's really rooted in a white supremacist society and system, quite honestly, um, around how do we view individuals who are um, racial or cultural or ethnic uh, minorities in this country, that that's part of where it was sort of rooted, that um, if you look at the history of how we sort of, you know, frame uh, mental health issues that, you know, that were created societally versus um, that are, are more organic, that, you know, people of color, if they had, a, you know, a mental health concern, they were seen as being deviant or something to that nature, it was criminalized, it was something was wrong with them, because it, because of course the society is a great society, for was a certain population. So it's really, really rooted in a, a lack of understanding of people's cultural and ethnic identities. Um, and then, you know, trying to look at it from a particular lens that is inconsistent with people's identities and, and their cultural background. So I'll, I'll just start with that. I'm sure people have other things. So that's just, you know, maybe an opening thing. And um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I would kind of build upon that and echo in thinking about the diagnostic procedure that is rooted within white supremacy, right, and the diagnostic categories. So, for example, I do work with Black girls and young Black women, and when we think about what depression and anxiety looks like within that population, we know that it can look different than what depression looks like in white girls and white women or white people, and oftentimes the diagnostic categories that we utilize to understand and diagnose individuals are based on research um, and practice with white individuals. And so I think that aspect also um, contributes to the misdiagnosis and the underdiagnosis of um, Black girls and Black women, but also when we think a little bit broadly around BIPOC individuals um, and thinking about how that has kind of impacted different disparities in diagnosis across different subgroups. So I'll stop there. Good. Uh... I would like to jump in uh, really quick and also add that a lot of the times we tend to focus at the individual level in regards to seeing uh, pathology. And so we tend to uh, use these uh, uh, tools and weaponize to target uh, non-white uh, individuals or uh, marginalized BIPOC individuals, since a lot of uh, what we're talking about is rooted on white-centric uh, European Western and essentially just white supremacy It's uh, intended to um, oppress. Uh, and so a lot of the times that's dismissed is not just the history behind it, but also how, uh, why, why is it that individuals perhaps may be encountering certain experiences? Reality is it's embedded within systems uh, and not just systems, oppressive racist systems. Uh, and so it, when we just look at it through the individual lens, it's really just focusing and pathologizing and putting a problem on the individual, neglecting the full story of uh, the overarching system. So this is where the ecology comes in, uh, communities in relation to something broader and uh, some of that broader can even be just history as well. So I also want to be able to highlight that piece. Yeah, to go deeper on that, um, everybody's answers have been spot on. Um, I've worked extensively with incarcerated populations, particularly Black folks uh, at all levels uh, of, of um, incarceration. And one thing that comes to mind for me with this question is um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So uh, we can't even focus on mental health if we don't have our basic needs met. 
And so within the Black community, um, BIPOC, the greater BIPOC community in urban areas such as Richmond, Virginia, um, if we have a large quantity of our BIPOC population, not even being, being able to have stable housing, um, consistent access to fresh food, um, uh, good income coming in, right? Um, being underemployed is, is very common. Um, if we aren't meeting those needs, many in that in, in these communities aren't going to even realize that there is a mental health issue going on, much less be able to explain that to uh, healthcare providers um, who are not well versed in BIPOC life. Um, so I just wanted to add that in. Um, I guess I will add in as well. And I just wanted to also thank everyone for being here and for inviting me to be here as well. Um, I agree with everything that the entire panel is saying. I also just wanted to mention that there's this term, um, drapetomania, um, which was a supposed mental illness that back in the 1850s a um, physician hypothesized as being the cause for enslaved um, Africans fleeing captivity. The thought was that, why would anyone wanna leave um, slavery? That must be a, a sickness. And so even back then we have these um, structural type of policies around slavery that um, was initiated and instigated and have continued. And so since then it's been used as a way to kind of um, oppress um, certain populations. Um, I'll say too that, um, you know, I know for African Americans, particularly, they are going to be less likely to receive a schizophrenia diagnosis um, than a bipolar diagnosis compared to whites. Um, and they are more likely across the board to have or be diagnosed with a more severe depression. Um, and this is problematic um, because this misdiagnosis has implications for treatment. Um, and if we're not diagnosing correctly and are um, um, you know, um, what Brooke was saying earlier, kind of thinking about the, the, the di diagnostician or the physician's biases, then it has implications for treatment and seeking um, appropriate treatment for those, so those folks. Because, so I would add um, to that, there's this level of unconscious bias and stereotypes that um, has persisted um, that can explain um, a lot of why we, we see this misdiagnosis as well. And let me also just want to address the criminalization part of this, that if you have an individual, a BIPOC individual having a mental health crisis, then rather than sometimes calling the crisis unit, the police show up, you know, and then an individual is end up unfortunately taken to uh, a jail versus to a hospital to get treatment. So there's a, there's a bias that's involved in this that negatively impacts people's lives that I think, you know, needs to be addressed and people need to be more aware of. Um, because the person who is the BIPOC and they're having mental health, they're, they're identified as not necessarily sometimes needing help, they're dangerous. So those factors come into play, then if I see you as dangerous, how do I then treat you? And then how does that escalate and exacerbate whatever the mental health crisis might be? So I think, you know, those contextual pieces of a, you know, as, you know, Oswald, a, a sort of white-centric sort of viewpoint has an impact on treatment as Dr. Hayes has, has pointed out as, as well. You know, if I can just add one example in terms of my work is even with migration, uh, where a lot of the times where communities are migrating uh, to the United States could be due to trauma, could be to other uh, lived experiences, but uh, the system, the structures embedded in place is seen as a threat to the country, is seeing them uh, labeled through uh, uh, perhaps a certain way, and instead of providing treatment and care, are incarcerated or quote unquote deported. So that is an example. And why? So when we start asking ourselves, why? Because again, it's these structures are rooted on this white centric because you are a threat because you are an other. And so it really poses the question again about the structures that place the system, neglecting the fact that a lot of uh, countries, especially within the southern border, were historically the land of uh, not, so I, mean, I don't have to dive in here, but really highlighting those pieces of criminalization, highlighting instead of really uh, seeking support or access, it's really doing the opposite. Also up there because my dog started barking. 
I would also add really quickly in thinking about systems and from a developmental standpoint, um, thinking about the criminalization of Black boys, particularly in school systems, right, and thinking about like a higher diagnosis of conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder and how that trickles into the Black family, right, in terms of resisting those labels on their children as a sense of protection and creates mistrust from Black families and systems of providers and thinking through also this kind of pipeline between diagnosis, underdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, and treatment outcomes. Thank you all for your wonderful answers. Again, my name is Shayla Davis. Um, and just to summarize everything that you have said, um, so we see that uh, mis misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, and criminalization has been rooted in white supremacy and how um, minorities are viewed in society. Um, and this is used as a tool to weaponize white supremacy, um, embedded within racist oppression systems that um, if we don't focus on mental health, we don't. Oh, I'm sorry. We don't understand, you know, how to meet our basic needs. Our basic needs is um, one of the things that, you know, white supremacy used to weaponize um, oppression and um, mental health can <laughs> look difficult in many cultures. Um, so, with that being said, uh, Dr. Moreno. Can you talk a little bit about your work with uh, Esperanza Research Program and your work on the mental health um, care and mental health disparities of minorities? Absolutely. So when uh, our work really looks at um, access to care broadly defined, uh, really looks at cultural, contextual, and systemic factors that play a role within uh, uh, diagnoses as well as access to care um, and really looking at it through, yes, the disparity in regards to the prevalence numbers, but really looking at it as a health inequality because it's highlighting the infrastructure at play. So it's not just that someone just uh, is uh, seeking less care. There's a reason behind it. And so that reason is what our research really unfolds. It's really perhaps uh, not putting the onus or the responsibility on the individual. Yes, psychoeducation matters, but what also matters is uh, really looking at get these broader uh, aspects. This is where critical consciousness comes in. This could, could perhaps could be advocacy. This is perhaps where policy and legislation Legislative uh, legislation comes in. So yes, although we engage on a lot of CBPR community-based participatory research, we really want to have data inform even policies to be able to inform the broader picture. One good example, since I'm in psychology, uh, yes, we are uh, some uh, we could focus on an irrational thought, for example, like a CBT. But uh, if we just focus on that without really looking at it at the broader systemic factor, it's neglecting the fact that some of these thoughts can be real for certain communities. Uh, they, uh, it's uh, for a privileged individual, it can be irrational, but for certain communities, it could be very rational. Uh, the the threat, the, and so at that point, yes, let's deal with at the individual level, but also let's build some empowerment consciousness to then be able to target uh, advocacy uh, and really work with stakeholders to really look at the broader picture. Because again, the uh, if we just look at it at the individual level, it's really targeting and pathologizing and putting the responsibility at the individual and the community level, neglecting the fact that the system is what's doing this. Uh, and so our work really looks at that. Uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll if I were to zoom in, we engage a lot in uh, Spanish speaking and um, uh, Latin immigrant health. Uh, and so we, as, as I mentioned, really thinking about all these anti-immigrant rhetoric, thinking about all these anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiments and policies that play DACA, TPS, documentation, citizenship, uh, uh, and uh, really seeing it through uh, a racist lens. These are very racist uh, uh, policies. Why? Because uh, again, it's trying, it's it's seeing the quote unquote other as a threat, as a quote unquote illegal. And so it's really
really trying to criminalize. Uh, why? Because it's trying to control the uh, main centric uh, ideology of white supremacy. And so us really targeting and how that impacts mental health, uh, but also really how can it inform policy legislation where it drives us to liberation, where it drives us to really decentering uh, these uh, notions of what we've learned, uh, but really celebrating, honoring really history, roots, uh, indigeneity, uh, and part of that is through uh, decolonial work, uh, and uh, that is the type of work that we engage in at La Esperanza. Thank you for that. And just to uh, summarize everything you said, and if uh, I miss any part, please feel free to add on. Um, you said basically your research is at um, La Esperanza is on the access to care and disparity um, as health inequalities. Um, by looking at the broader aspects such as policy, um, we can see that there's a neglect within the basic needs of the people that the system is oppression or the other. Okay. And with that being said, thank you again, Dr. Moreno. Um, uh, for Dr. Green, um, how has your experience working with the youth and focusing on child development related to your research and the experience of multiracial Black youth? And what are some of the ways that you hope to incorporate your field of research into today's practice? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for those who don't know, a subsection of my research focuses on multiracial Black youth, which means those who have one Black parent and one parent from a different racial or ethnic group. Um, and so thinking about this question, I like to push back a little bit on the fact that it's adjacent to child development research and practice, right? Multiracial Black youth are still youth um, going through development, but they are oftentimes left out of conversations um, about child development and even about racialized child development, right? And so when we think about the historical tenets of mental health and mental health disparities, part of that is tied to socio-historical conceptualizations of race. And that's a chunky term, but essentially, white supremacy was put in place and alongside of that were strict color lines between different racial or ethnic groups right in an effort to uphold white supremacy and create division between groups um and so what happens now as a result years later is that multiracial black youth kind of defy those strict color lines and they become less visible in our conversations because they don't quite fit in any group cleanly, right? So they are subject to anti-Black racism and that has implications for their mental health. But they're also subject and vulnerable to instances of multiracial bias like um, identity invalidation, social isolation, um, and that has implications for their mental health as well. But we don't know a whole lot about their multiracial experiences because they're not being communicated about or included in conversations. Um, and so my work has really kind of situated in better amplifying this population. And I do it for two reasons. One being that they're one of the fastest growing populations in the country and in Richmond, Virginia, actually. Um, and they report some of the highest rates of substance use, depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation, and isolation. And so thinking about that, um, it really, at least for me, makes it clear that we need to better support this um, population's experiences. Um, and then from a practical realm, right, if we don't understand all of their pathways to well-being, we can't support them practically or therapeutically. And so I hope to kind of build this area of research and then also use it to inform practice um, in terms of community and family level interventions. Um, thank you for that. Um, again, I'm going to summarize and if I miss anything, please feel free to add on. Basically, what you said is that white supremacy and um, color lines are used to create division within um, the multiracial Black youth, and that um, is particularly used to blur those lines. Um, and that we need to include uh, multiracial Black uh, youth within the mental health conversation and understand the pathways to their betterment. All right. So with that being said, um, this question is for Dr. Moreno and Dr. Green. How has the way you grew up and where you come from shaped your idea of mental health?
I I can jump in. Um, I definitely lived experience has played a key role. Uh, I would say the lived experience equates to expertise as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, my lived experience, although during these times, perhaps to not have a label to it, or I was not speaking how I am speaking now, that is where um, through my own process, reflection, knowledge, my own uh, awareness uh, um, has played a role through my formative years in training as well. Uh, I would say that uh, my graduate uh, degree or just overall higher education also has informed as also a first generation uh, college student and now a first generation faculty. So I, I would say that my lived experience within my own identities, really uh, seeing uh, the, yeah, I mean, being, seeing it within, not outside in, uh, um, has definitely shaped, formed, um, but it's also been a very formative um, journey to say. Uh, but uh, I would like to, since it is being recorded, highlight again that education or expertise does not come from a degree or does not come from just an education specifically when it's uh, a lot of education that was not intended for us to even be at uh, or be in. Uh, so uh, the expertise also plays a key role in regards to actually lived experiences. Uh, so for me, all this has played a role in regards to my knowledge, uh, my awareness, uh, my attitude, and also the skills utilized uh, around these themes. Uh. I would just echo, honestly, all of that. Um, and especially the point about experiencing something within and what that means for your devotion, but also your ability to examine it externally, right? And of course, there's safeguards for um, just validity and reliability and all of these things. But as a multiracial Black person, I would not have had the the perspective that I have within this work had I not had my lived experiences, right? So typically in the literature, we think about multiracial Black youth either as just Black youth or biracial youth. But I know based on my lived experiences that it's more intersectional than that and more intertwined and more fluid. And so, and I've now demonstrated that within my research, right? And that comes directly from my lived experiences. And then also thinking through like, where have I felt undervalued or underseen and how can I pull that from other groups, right? So who else are we not seeing fully within our research or our practices to better support them? And that comes from my own positionality. So I would echo that and kind of add those things. Thank you very much, Dr. Moreno and Dr. Green for your responses. Um, to summarize a little bit of what both of you guys said, the main thing is that um, lived experience can definitely lead to expertise. And I really like the line that Dr. Moreno said where education doesn't just come from a degree, um, especially seeing how your lived experiences such as as a first gener generation uh, American or as a multiracial individual will inform your training, um, including your higher education, the perspective that you approach your research through. and um, especially considering how complex intersectionality is, especially between um, sexualities or gender or race, um, fully understanding the nuances of that can be fully elaborated via lived experience more so than in education, I think. And being able to analyze the problems that you personally face to see what needs there are in the community, I think is also a very powerful thing. So thank you again. All right. Now I had a question for Professor Brooke Taylor. Um, Professor Taylor, what was your experience like working with LGBTQ plus youth and how do you think mental health resources in the medical field and community help or sometimes don't help LGBTQIA plus folk? Thank you. Thanks for the question. I'm gonna refer to LGBTQIA plus as queer. Um, 
I, I do want to say um, uh, it's a shortcut I'm taking here, and not everyone identifies as queer, but I, I'm going to use the, the term queer here. Um, so one thing is uh, queer youth are the same as any other youth, right? Like they are um, in a time, you know, if you're talking about from middle school through high school, um, they're in a, a time of growth and exploration about who they are in the world and, and building their autonomy, um, which is difficult regardless of if you identify as queer or not. Um, marginalized identities um, can scaffold uh, or build on each other. And so when we're talking about queer youth, uh, my experience with uh, POC queer youth was very different than my experience with white queer youth. Um, and that's not to say that white queer youth had it easier, but my black and brown queer youth had different marginalizations in addition to race and ethnicity that scaffold on to their queerness, right? And so an example of that would be, um, I had a, a, a black trans youth, trans boy who, um, couldn't even find consistent transportation to the group that we were doing, right? Um, in addition, he had he was on probation. Um, he had different um, law issues he was dealing with and he was homeless. Um, so we were fighting to get him into foster care. Um, and so different organizations tend to, whether it's intentional or not, um, that serve queer youth end up serving more white queer youth than black and brown or BIPOC in general. And I think that that happens for uh, a multitude of reasons, but uh, one that I'll focus on is the stigma that comes along with um, being black and queer. Um, we've come a long way. Uh, and in 2023, it is definitely not the same as it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, to to be openly queer, but there are still um, pervasive ideas about what queerness means in relation to blackness, um, particularly the idea that uh, queerness originated with Europeans, right? And so like the the idea that this is a white thing, like black people, brown people aren't queer, like this is um, you know, something that you've learned, right? Um, and then if we say it's something you've learned, the next step is, well, how do you unlearn it type thing, right? Um, instead of accepting people for who they are. Um, and so my experience with queer youth overall, whether I'm talking about in jails and prisons or um, in, the, in the free world, um, my experience is that they are just like regular youth, um, but they have a need, a greater need for connection they have a greater need for safety um, and also for um, being able to express themselves in ways that feel good for them. Uh, and that might change depending on uh, the youth that we're talking about. Um, so the other part of the question was, um, do you mind repeating that for me? Yes, of course. Um, the question was, how's your experience like working with queer youth and how do you think mental health resources in the medical field and community help or maybe sometimes don't help queer folks? Yeah, so number one, there's just not enough resources, period, right? Um, the biggest challenge is being able to find uh, therapists or clinicians who actually are taking patients, number one. Uh, number two, if there is a identity uh, preference, right? So if you have a um, a black or brown youth who says, I don't feel comfortable working with a white therapist, but we can't find um, an, an open uh, PLC therapist, right? Or any other identity that you could sub in, right? Um, it might be a queer youth that doesn't feel comfortable working with a straight therapist. Um, so the availability is an issue, but also um, when you get into payment, um, Many of our youth don't have, even if they are covered by their parents' insurance, um, they would have to explain why charges for therapists came up, right? And so they, they 
they wouldn't want necessarily, some of them wouldn't want to have to explain that and then potentially be outed. Um, also, there's not a lot of free resources. Um, and so those are all challenges, but I do want to say that the people who are in the field um, are doing their best and are overloaded with, with clients. Um, and so we need more Black queer therapists. We need more Black and Brown uh, clinicians. We need more Black and Brown PhDs that focus on LGBTQIA issues um, across the board. Um, we just need more resources. Um, even in a city like Richmond, that some people consider to be queer friendly, there's simply not enough resources. Um, and so my experiences with healthcare providers uh, that I have referred queer youth to are all outstanding. I haven't had a bad experience yet. Um, the issue is, are there enough? And there's not. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Got it. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, yeah, all great points. And I think the last thing you mentioned about just getting more um, individuals of color, getting more queer individuals in the medical field and in the space, like as you said, more brown people with PhDs, I think is definitely a, a great step towards helping to fight some of these stigmas of the intersectionality and helping basically everyone understands sort of the complexities when both those identities intersect. So thank you very much. Hey, Rome, and I just, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just <laughs> saw a question that I think is a great one. Um, all of the questions are great, by the way, but I wanted to address the last one uh, from an anonymous, uh, excuse me, anonymous attendee. Uh, can the panelists share more about their backgrounds and lived experience in plain language? This would help me and perhaps others in the audience better identify with their drives, perspectives, and positions. And I think that's an important uh, ask and a valid ask because sometimes when we, you know, are on these panels, um, you know, all of us are scholars, all of us are are in the field of academics, and um, sometimes we forget that uh, the way that we speak is not always inclusive. Right, and so I wanted to highlight that question and also give some of what that person wanted. Um, my experiences and backgrounds, um, I am a product of HBCUs, um, Hampton, Howard, Virginia Union. Um, blackness is my core identity well before my queerness. Um, I come from a, uh, a very religious family. My grandfather is a prominent pastor and my, um, my pathway to understanding who I was fully uh, took, you know, a couple decades of acceptance. Um, along the way, I had a great support system outside of my family. Uh, my family took a little longer to come around uh, with my queerness. Um, but in terms of mental health, I have um, been lucky enough to have had experience in high school with a therapist who worked as an anger management specialist at my high school, which is very rare. And so my <clears throat> introduction to therapy um, began in, at the high school level and I've, I've been um, with a therapist ever since. Um, I'm very, I was very blessed and lucky to find a black female therapist in Richmond, Virginia that had an opening in her schedule and I've been with her for over six years. Um, I tell all my students, everyone needs a therapist, regardless of you know, whether you, you think you need it or not, but particularly black folks in America, we need a therapist. We've been through some stuff, right? Um, and so I just wanted to give a little bit more about who I am um, and what I do in, in order to um, answer that question. My passion, is incarcerated populations. Uh, I'm a PhD student currently um, focusing on uh, black girls and um, incarceration. And so I just wanted to honor that question and would encourage everyone to do the same. Got it. Thank you, Professor. Um, this is a very important discussion. I'm really glad that you shared your experiences. I feel like that definitely helps to contextualize some of the research and the, um, the reason behind why you even got to it. 
for the sake of time, we are going to push that question to the end just so we can get to everybody else. And then if everyone else would like to share their answers to that question, I'd be much appreciated. Um, so yeah, next we have a question for Dr. Rochelle Hayes with uh, a beer. Thank you. Yes, so for Dr. Rochelle Hayes, why is it important to address tobacco cessation and weight management as behavioral health issues for underserved populations? And how are these challenges an issue related to individual behavior and social, economic, and environmental factors? Thank you, um, Abir, for that. And I will start by um, addressing the, um, the comment. So I am a biracial, female, um, Black, and Filipino, Southeast Asian, born and raised right here in Richmond, literally Petersburg, Matoka, Virginia. Um, did my training here at VCU, so I'm a graduate of VCU. I went down south to North Carolina to do my undergraduate and lived up north for 12, 13 years before coming back as faculty five, six years ago. Um, my family is also very religious. I'm Catholic. Um, and I do identify as cisgender. I am um, um, biracial, but I am married to a white male. So my children are triracial and I live here in Richmond. My, I am a clinical health psychologist and um, my passion is in helping people improve their health. And primarily I've been working in tobacco control and weight management, but primarily it's with tobacco control for most of my career. Um, the reasons for that is because these are the two main behaviors that are, um, if addressed and um, if addressed correctly, prevent um, chronic disease and cancer particularly. So I'm a cancer pre prevention and control scientist at Massey Cancer Center as well. Um, so I'll start with tobacco. Um, there's a lot of social justice issues around tobacco control lately with menthol, but I'll just say that still, even now, 12.5% of adults are using tobacco. And we know that with its use, it still leads to, to, to death and comorbidities. Um, when we think about the social determinants model of health, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, um, uh, it's really um, a lot of those factors like demographics, um, housing, income, socioeconomics, a lot of those things are gonna be related to smoking. And in fact, um, it's really, um, you know, men, um, people with lower education, people who live below poverty, people from the South or the Midwest, those people who are uninsured or in medic have Medicaid, those with disabilities, physical or mental health disability, and serious psychological concerns, as well as American Indians and Alaska Natives, and our LGBTQ. IA population, those populations um, within our social different categories of social determinants of health are more likely to smoke. And also over the years, you know, we can see this trend of smoking rates. It was 60, 50% back in the 1960s. Nowadays, it's less, um, obviously 12.5%, but um, we're not decreasing it as much for these um, populations. And so I um, have been spending a lot of my work developing interventions focused on, on this um, patient population, um, um, me medically and psychologically ill populations who also smoke and um, light and intermittent smokers, Latino and African-American smokers. Um, the same type of thing can be said with obesity. You know, we've got a lot of correlates um, with um, obesity. Um, it, two out of three folks in the US now are either overweight or obese. And why is that? Well, it's not just due to health behaviors. You know, of course, there's some addiction playing with sh playing a role with um, obesity and with sugar and nicotine for tobacco, but it's also our, um, our environment um, and policies um, and the people that we're around, our peers. Um, I'll say that with um, tobacco, one way we know this for sure is that this um, regulation of taxes on tobacco have been the number one reason why we've been able to get um, tobacco to prevalence rates so low for taxing. So we know that, that that is a mechanism that works, right? But yet Virginia is actually one of the states that taxes tobacco the least in the country. 
And we see those various differences in different states. And why is that, you know? And so that really kind of pushes me to like, you know, how can I help patients, people here who are not given the same opportunities? Um, I'll, I'll say that um, one program that I've developed at the Cancer Center is um, not just for our patients, but we are providing a, what's called, I call it the We Can Quit program. So I'm trying to use not just individual methods to treat tobacco dependence, but we're trying to address structural determinants of health of smoking by, um, by um, getting peers, so other um, persons of color who smoke who have quit, I'm training them to do smoking cessation counseling. They reach out, they're the champions, they're talking to the people in the communities, not even patients here, but people who are in our community. My belief is that as a psychologist, I do think that if um, people learn from other people, we do learn from other people, right? So if we can convince the communities that smoking is bad and it's not, it's, it's a great thing to use medication, okay? And um, you do need to see a therapist to help you with smoking. If we can um, teach these folks to, 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 um, to emulate that message to the community and have community members um, be a champion for that, I think it would be a, a great way. Um, and I know that NIMHD, National Institute of Minority Health Disparities, they're now um, working towards telling us researchers and clinicians that we've got to lay off this focus on the individual and really start to develop interventions where we're addressing these structural determinants of health um, and um, wanting to see more multi-level intervention work. I'll just say um, with, with regard to my earlier comment about tobacco, you know, I know that a lot of people have heard about this whole menthol thing and um, this is a social justice issue. There is a reason why menthol has not been eradicated from cigarettes. We do know that there is an association with menthol and increased um, nicotine dependence and a greater or worsened um, or um, decreased ability to quit because of someone who's a menthol smoker. And um, we and some colleagues are thinking about like, what are people gonna do if they all of a sudden ban menthol, which would be great. I am a proponent for that. If they do, are these people going to have the resources out there um, uh, to seek the help, the appropriate help for, for that? So, you know, also I'll say that much like the LGBTQIA population, um, Blacks um, have been heavily targeted to um, use tobacco. Um, there are particular ads with Joe Camel as a Black Joe Camel back in the day. Um, particularly targeting or put in tobacco retail outlets in, um, in places like Petersburg, where I, I grew up. My father actually worked for um, Brown and Williams back in the day. Um, so maybe that's a little bit of my passion as well. But there is this um, relationship between the environment and, and, and um, social policies and um, that play a role in health behaviors that then will have an impact on health. So I can see, say a lot about that, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. And yeah. for the sake of time, I'm just gonna shift over to Dr. Jihad Aziz. Um, as the Executive Director of University Counseling Services here at BCU, a few questions we have are, what are some of the mental health issues that you consider to be the most pressing among BCU students of color today? And what are the challenges that you face trying to provide su the support and care? Thank you. And I'll, I'll try to, you know, for the sake of time, I'll try to keep my remarks brief so we can stay on time with what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, what we see the primary concerns are anxiety and depression. It's pretty consistent across the board. And we've seen those go up consistently over the years. Um, you know, what we're looking at is, you know, for us, it's really like why? why there are more acuity, where is there more anxiety, more anxious depression, you know, and what we're finding from our conversations with students um, is really looking at sort of like, what are the vicarious tra traumatic experiences that people are experiencing? Um, you know, we historically have known that police brutality has, has occurred, and we can hear that, which is very different than now you have a body work camera, you're able to see it on CNN, you're able to see it on TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram. Um, the same with many of the other sort of traumatic things that happen out in the community that then 
um, can also create a, a sense of fear and anxiety and concern about safety. And that's, you know, for people of color, especially, and also, you know, BIPOC community as a whole. So I think we, we got to think about, about that impact. So you see an increase in um, anxiety and depression for, for VCU students. One thing I have to say is the good thing is that there are campus resources that are available, which are very different than oftentimes in the community. Um, so you find that these things are happening in the community and people don't actually have the kind of resources or availability to get the services that they need. Um, so when we talk about the challenges, I think the challenges for us, you know, you know, on, on one hand, we have resources that are available. On the other, we don't have enough to be able to provide that kind of uh, resource. Um, and I think, you know, we have to think about how do you hire? Because um, what we know is that, you know, representation helps. So if you can have more people, they don't necessarily need to provide the services. But if we know historically, and I, you know, just as a quick thing, like if I'm riding down the highway and I pull off at a rest stop, I'm looking for people who look like me because I'm scanning to determine whether it's safe. Um, so the more representation that we can have um, and, and university counseling services and other places helps people to know that this might be a safe place and that we have mental health clinicians who are hopefully have in practice culture humility and actually not misdiagnose or un underdiagnose and be able to provide the kind of support that students need so that they can be successful. Thank you very, very much, doctor. Uh, thank you very much, doctor. Um, I think everything you said is a, is a great point, um, especially the needing more representation in counseling services and um, services like that um, would definitely help to provide the exact type of support that students need at VCU. Uh, even though we do have services, you're saying that we may not have precisely enough. So yeah, thank you so much. And if we could now transition to the audience questions, that would work. Thanks. I think, um, Jill, did you want to ask that last question? I think that might be an important one for everyone. We can maybe we can start our discussion there. Um, yes. Um, so this is a question for everyone. Um, for the people who are in healthcare. What can they do to address or readdress the inequalities that we've discussed about healthcare and providing mental health treatment for people of racial, ethnic, and other minoritized groups? Anyone should feel free to jump in. You have to end on a hard note, right? Oh, I'm sorry, okay, Dr. Um, that's a big question. Um, a lot of things. I think that um, we do need to practice cultural humil humility um, because we do represent ourselves, but we don't necessarily represent or know all, all different cultures. So I think that's really important, um, no matter your age or your training, um, to always um, go into a meeting um, from assessment to diagnosis, practicing that. Um, I think for myself as a biracial um, female therapist and researcher, um, you know, keep going. Um, I want to keep going and I want to be able to um, practice some mentorship. Um, so everyone in my lab is actually a person of color um, and try to promote them to get them into um, graduate school. Um, I actually just went to my son's school for career day to talk about psychology and mental health. So starting at the youngest levels, um, that's what happened for me. It was very really, um, eye-opening for me to hear um, someone talk about therapy and psychiatry when I was in high school. Um, um, and um, I think, um, um, you know, the, 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 the problem, I, I agree, has been this lack of accessibility. Um, and I think, you know, as much as we can to, to promote the science and um, the field, there has been reduced stigma around mental health lately, especially with the onset of COVID-19 and there is a need for it uh, with the use of telehealth. So I think continuing to be involved in public health policies, um, addressing some of the things. And so um, not just practicing my own individual 
therapy, but also sitting at the national table um, talking about mental health parity, um, I'm writing as much as I can. If, if I'm able and willing to be a part of that discussion, I think that's um, where we can. And I think you don't need to, um, like we were talking before, if you had some lived experience, you know, that that's important too, to, to be able to kind of come to the table and, and voice your opinion. If I can just add, um, I echo Dr. Hayes's um, uh, insights. Uh, for me, when when I hear the term and I've been sitting with is is um, essentially radical healing, is uh, really sitting with uh, what does radical healing look like and really thinking about it in terms of liberation, where uh, drawing an understanding that uh, theory frameworks uh, where the history behind it and part of liberation may also include self-knowledge. What do we know? What does our community know? Uh, not just sitting with knowledge from another um, framework or ideology, but we, really this is where like for me, again, lived experience comes in because that's what we know. And so part of liberation is holding truth uh, to this self-knowledge, which leads to cultural authenticity, really just being authentic with self and within the community as well, knowing that uh, this may be one way of healing in terms of what uh, the Western education is saying, but knowing that our community sees multiple ways, right? Churches can be uh, a way, uh, cultural healing can be. So like really sitting with a cultural authenticity and also this radical hope, of like, yes, like let's have this radical uh, idea of like there is still hope uh, perhaps through these other means and methods. Uh, and then the other uh, side of uh, radical healing for me is the inter uh, understanding the interlocking systems uh, of oppression, right? This is where critical consciousness comes in. This is where strength comes in. This is where resistance comes in and uh, most importantly, knowing who our allies and our villages, right? Sitting with emotional and social supports. Uh, so when when I hear that question in terms of what can we do is really sitting with this radical healing with these all these domains uh, uh, listed. Yeah, I, I would only add that, you know, I think when we talk about what what can we do, I, th I think the challenge sometimes is that we just need to acknowledge things, you know, it is what it is, and then how do we move forward, right? So I think when we say that a system is built on white supremacy, that can be sort of offensive and people can struggle with that. When we versus just been saying it is, that's how it was built. You know, people, BIPOC individuals were not considered in, in, in the creation of it. Okay, so now where do we go from here? And that's where I think cultural humility is a really important part. The healthcare workers really know that, you know, if we can do that and not to be defensive, then we can have more expansive thought about, you know, as, as I indicated, like what's healing and then being more open to the different ways of healing. I think one of the ways, you know, I always, the example is that, you know, there's multiple ways to get to four and that's the outcome is healing. So it's two plus two, two times two, one plus one plus one, three plus, you know, versus saying this is the only way to actually get there. But I think if we, if we can acknowledge that there's multiple ways and not one way, and we can be expansive in our thought process um, and really do our own self-work, because I think that's what it requires, that if we're going to have, you know, okay, therapeutic terms, transference, counter-transference, <laughs> you know, I, you know, we're going to have responses and reactions to people. We need to understand where that's coming from for us um, and our own biases that impact the work that we do, because we have them. And it's, and it's okay to own them. Because then once you own them, then you can do something about them. Um, so I think there's, there's, there requires an awareness of healthcare providers around their own system of understanding education in itself, around the work that they do, and how that can negatively impact the people they're providing care to. Do the other panelists want to add anything there? Um, I feel like it's all really been said. I guess the only thing that keeps coming to mind based on my work is thinking about health promotion and prevention. So before necessarily distress comes into play, thinking about how we can equip BIPOC youth and families with things like radical hope or racial pride that can protect them 
from racism as we also try to diminish that from happening, right? To the point where their, their mental health is not as vulnerable to those attacks because of radical hope, because of racial pride, because of collectivism. And so thinking about um, programs that can be implemented at the individual, like at your kitchen table, right? With your son or your daughter or your child. Um, as a school teacher, what books are you providing? All of these things have also been shown to um, have implications for promoting and protecting the well-being of our children um, outside of a therapeutic setting. Yeah, the only thing I would add, I think it, most of it has been said. Um, I think that even with acknowledging the biases, um, as Dr. Z said, um, we also need to be uh, very intentional about not assuming anything about clients. Um, even when you have a PhD, even when you have 10, 15 years of experience, even when you think you know it all, um, each client that you meet, each person that you meet has their own individual experiential knowledge. Um, as someone said in the beginning, all knowledge isn't learned at college, right? And so not assuming that because someone is queer, they want certain things or don't want certain things, not assuming that because someone is a person of color, the same, right? Um, and that to me is, it, it needs to be taught um, at all levels of education, but particularly, you know, VCU has a fantastic social work school. It needs to be taught at the MSW level. It needs to be taught at the, at the PhD level that acknowledging your biases is not a bad thing. And also we have to work towards not allowing those biases to make us assume things about the people that we work with and not just the individuals, but their whole communities, right? Um, many people assume terrible things about black Richmond communities, right? Um, there's, there's ideas about if uh, folks come from public housing, right? What that means for them and what that means for um, their potential treatment. And I think throwing those assumptions out, um, you know, is, is a critical piece to serving with integrity. Thank you. Um, unless anyone else has anything else to add, I think I'm gonna shift over to um, audience questions. Um, we have some big ones. So the, maybe we'll start with um, trauma playing a major role. I think this was implicitly addressed, but maybe if, if anyone wants to take this on, more explicitly, um, tra trauma plays a major role in diagnosis and is not being addressed properly. How can we improve on this? I would say I agree. I, I, you know, I think you know trauma shows up and presents differently for for BIPOC individuals. Um, and if you're not knowledgeable enough around that, then you misdiagnosis and misunderstand it. And oftentimes, trauma ends up you know end up with a becomes people perceive this characterological um, versus a normal response to being oppressed. Um, so, you know, it, it, it go really go, you know, I think I could harp on this. It really goes back to people being informed and better educated. You know, I think we, we people need to start, clinicians and individuals need to start with empathy and really look at themselves. But if, you know, but if you're ill-informed about who you are and your own biases and how that impacts, then you continue to perpetuate the harm. Um, so I think it's it's really about um, and and you know as was stated by Professor Taylor is that there's an intentionality to self improvement and development and it requires work. Um, so it's not just going to a workshop and learning something. It's, it requires time outside of that to really think about who I am, what does that mean, what are my biases, how how am I perpetuating this, and you know coming to realization there might be some things that you don't like about yourself that then you have control over changing. So I think it's really about um, individuals developing the skill sets to, and really looking at themselves to be able to apply a better better care model for, for, for people that, that they're providing services. I'll just add that we always want to provide um, trauma-informed care. Um, and knowing how and when to ask these questions. Um, I think on the provider side, it's always important, you know, when I'm training medical students or psychology students how to deal with this is, 
you know, we have to ask the questions and to not shy away from these traumas, but, you know, develop that relationship um, with, with the, your patient or client um, so that there is some, some sense of trust um, that is formed. And I also from the patient side, I think, you know, it is great that mental health stigma is decreasing, but I think, you know, sometimes when I'm working with patients, they, they don't necessarily want to reveal everything at, at, in the, you know, at the beginning. Um, and so I think we also have to educate patients, you know, that if you don't jive with that patient or that clinician the first time, stick with it, just one more session or say something, you know, you know, how come you didn't ask me about this? Um, and I, I think like working and, you know, exploring and teaching folks to have those open dialogues with your therapist, um, because we as therapists, we should be able to hear those questions from our patients. Um, it's all about patient-centered care. I think the other component as well is really taking in at a heart, at every stage, the social determinants of health. So when we look at it through social determinants of health, we're really looking at it through the environmental conditions in which our clients live uh, and uh, all these different structures. Uh, and so by looking at it, right, uh, then we, we could also be, I, I think that that's where like clinically, even just like ACEs for children or negative life events, which are connected to uh, many times are associated within uh, trauma. And so uh, really honing in social determinants of health uh, in our conceptualization treatment plans and forward allows us for an opportunity to really dive into uh, trauma. Real quickly, I'll just add from a, from the other perspective, right? We've been talking about the clinician, but from the patient perspective, uh, many of our BIPOC youth um, and adults, for that matter, don't realize that what they've been through is trauma. Um, we we haven't been taught that, like, yeah, just because it happens to so many people, you know, it's still important and it's still trauma, right? Like just because, you know, your parents did the best they could, right? They still traumatized you, right? And so being able to call a thing a thing is super important. And um, that will take patience. Um, even for, for folks who are familiar with therapy, it's not going to come out in the first one, two, three, four, five sessions if, they've, if, if they are a person who has grown up like we all have with trauma around them, right? Um, but particularly, more specifically, different types of, of trauma um, that is normalized in different communities. Um, and even the idea that um, a, a sense of morality being placed on whether you can handle the trauma or not. Um, and, and that would get into different spiritual or religious practices, right? but we don't have time for that. But yeah, so the, the idea that if you if you go to a therapist, you're weak or like, hey, everybody in your family has dealt with that. Why can't you? Um, and so it is, it's for the patient and the clinician. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying to figure out the best way to try to condense all these questions because none of them is really, um, they're not going to be quick. The next one has to do with capitalism and the role that it plays in perpetuating racism and oppression. So that's that's another small, <laughs> a small topic: racism, uh, trauma, capitalism. Um, yeah. So if anyone wants to take that on, um, I guess well, you know, it's impossible to talk about white supremacy and all, and not also talk about capitalism, right? So maybe someone can um, can can bring some of those strands together. All right, I feel like I'm talking too much, or I'm just, or I just, I'm terrible at silences. <laughs> You're a therapist. You should know that. <laughs> I should, yeah, right. I should improve my skills. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you know, here the way I would tie capitalism is it's about it's about access. Um, that when you those who have you know the financial resources are able to get 
you know, easier and quicker access than it is for those who, who don't. So I think if we're looking at class issues, um, you know, when we look at, you know, our community service boards being over, you know, overwhelmed with so many individuals who are seeking services who, you know, and then we're, you know, we have lots of, you know, MSWs and other individuals who have the caseloads of a couple of hundred people. You know, what kind of service can they actually provide when you're trying to just get people out and get people seen? So it really impacts the quality of services that you're experiencing, um, you know, for that. So, you know, so I think, you know, capitalism has a huge impact. But for just briefly, for me, it's really about access because it's about having financial resources. You know, if you have more financial resources, quite honestly, you're able to get more access to support. Um, but if you don't, and also, you know, you know, not even, you know, um, as it was indicated earlier, transportation, you know, can you get that? You know, if I, I live out in Chesterfield and I'm in Lothian, you know what? There's no buses that would come from Richmond out there. So if you wanted, you know, a, an employment that would provide a job that would give you benefits to some degree that would allow access, you know, those routes and other places are cut off. So I think it's it's more systemic about sort of what, what are the ways that capitalism and access can impact um, a person's ability to, to then get resources for mental health concerns, just in general. I would also say building on that, it trickles down. And so thinking about somebody who works primarily with youth and adolescents, right? It trickles down into even parents who are of a lower class, their capacity to provide warm parenting and to provide constructive parenting and to be that emotional support when they're either at work or their mental health is in duress because they don't have access to the support that they need to then kind of trickle that down to support the mental health of their children, to monitor what they're doing, to remain engaged in their lives, which are all of these things that are supposed to be and have been proven to impact the mental health of children, right? So even outside of a therapeutic setting, thinking about how it can trickle down in terms of what access and support youth have um, in relation to their parents. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add really quick. Um, the, the one that to me comes to mind is advancing or advancement. Uh, and when we tie to worldviews of individualism versus, versus collectivism, individualism seeing like I want to advance, but not really thinking about everyone else advancing as well. Uh, and so that itself can be uh, detrimental. Why? Well, because in order for me to advance, I have to oppress someone else. Uh, uh, whereas if we start thinking about it as collectivism, it's like, okay, I want to progress and advance. I want a quality service, but how can I, along with everyone else around me, get the same. Uh, so that is uh, what comes to my mind as well in regards to advancement of quality care, life satisfaction, wellness, uh, resources, uh, but uh, doing it in a way that it's not just for me and uh, by doing that I'm oppressing someone else, but rather how can we all collectively go towards a direction together. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a couple of questions in a row now. We have, we're down to the last 15 minutes, and maybe we can, um, or maybe you all can start addressing them simultaneously. Um, so Albert um, Owusu in the um, in the webinar chat um, remarks, thanks for your presentation. I believe the relationship between the healthcare provider and patient plays a major role in determining treatment outcomes. Cultural differences can also contribute to the misdiagnoses of marginalized groups. I think a lot of you um, address this. And also there's a question, um, from Charlene Crowley. Um, can you provide parents of BIPOC children um, mislabeled um, uh, um, strategies of how to fight back and the implications of not doing so? Um, and then um, Charlene Crowley discusses a sister whose daughter was misdiagnosed with developmental delays, but then you know went on to get all A's and courses and got moved to a different class, um, a different school and got honors from a short pump area school. So I guess the question would be about um, misdiagnoses, cultural differences, and then um, strategies for um, parents um, of misdiagnosed or mislabeled children. I'll say very quickly that um, in my experience, many of the black and brown youth that um, go through the school to prison pipeline are mislabeled as uh, having learning disabilities. 
um, when really the issues are more behavioral. And I, I just want to sort of try to uh, answer the other qu another question in here that's about police officer training, right? Um, because I think it goes hand in hand. Um, when, you know, when we realize and acknowledge that policing in the United States is a direct uh, line from, from slavery, right? The, the first police officers were slave catchers, right? Then our expectation of the institution itself is adjusted appropriately, right? Um, that's not to say all policemen and women are racist or anything like that. This is to say that the entire institution of policing um, was made to, to monitor and police black lives, right? Um, and so I think that being clear about that and also um, building up our community resources to go outside of, uh, like when we have behavioral issues in schools, instead of having an SRO, a school resource officer, or having um, you know, a pipeline to, to jail and prison, we would have different ways of addressing conflict and uh, discipline within schools that would then give our youth uh, different tools in their toolbox as they grow into the adults that will then guide the next generation. Um, and so I, I just wanted to succinctly say that. Thank you. Anyone else wanna comment on that one? Ah, uh, you know, I'm going to say something. I can't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the, the, the only thing I would, would add is that, I, you know, it sounds like around advocacy was that, you know, that the parent did the thing. I mean, that's the, you know, we talked about people, an example of capitalism, people having the emotional resources to be able to do those things. But it really is about advocacy. Can you advocate for your child? Because that's that's what it takes in order when you have misdiagnosis, you know, and again, that's, you know, sometimes it's resource and time intensive. And unfortunately, you know, due to life circumstances, some people don't have that. But where it possible, you know, where parents can be involved as much as possible um, is, is to be involved in, in the school system and be able to advocate for what's going on. And that requires time and energy to be educated about what's going on. Um, you know what 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 a diagnosis is what's what the label is what does that mean what does it mean we have a 504 um and you know I, the reality is that a lot of times people don't have the capacity um or the wherewithal or the support to be able to do that unfortunately so it's incumbent upon you know people who are providing care and support if at all to be aware of that and to provide that for for people so i think you know if you can't advocate can you reach out to other people who might be advocates for you um, I think that would, would be helpful when I think about strategizing around this label, because you need to correct it because, you know, unfortunately, you know, it could follow you through if it's, if not addressed and that shapes people's perceptions of your child. Um, and then they, you know, we know that education, people treat people, how they, what their expectations are, <laughs> um, which then becomes, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy to, to some degree. I, I I agree, uh, and I, I would just quickly add that uh, the advocacy slash empowerment come to mind, and so there's this sense of like self-empowerment, empowering the next generation, empowering or finding ways uh, like allies to be able to do a collective empowerment, and so again, I revert to critical consciousness, and so when I think about critical consciousness, I'm thinking about it in three areas that perhaps are like the easiest like elevator speech of like one of a, the first one being critical awareness, uh, uh, being able to like uh, understand the process of learning and questioning these structures. So being able to create a space to just question these structures uh, and what these structures even mean and do to communities or families. Uh, that's so critical awareness being the first one, the second one being critical uh, motivation. Do we have the capacity and commitment to address these injustices? Uh, and so if I can do it, then who will be able to? So this is where uh, uh, the 
perhaps looking at your village, right? Or looking who can be able to be an ally. And the third one being the critical action piece, which is the advocacy piece in regards to creating social change or even being motivated to act, to advocate. So uh, those for me, in terms of critical consciousness could be taught in regards to the critical awareness, the critical motivation and the critical action of critical consciousness. Thank you. Um, sort of related to that, um, those remarks on critical consciousness, we have a couple questions about burnout. Um, so for healthcare providers from BIPOC backgrounds, how to manage being the bridge to help with access, but also having to shoulder <clears throat> productivity demands in clinical settings. And then a student from a, um, a bachelor program asks, you know, what, what do you recommend to continue creating space for queer mental health uh, care? Um, and address stigma for individuals struggling to find opportunities to have those conversations outside of the classroom. The questions on burnout and then um, addressing stigma and, and conversations outside the classroom. So I'm not a healthcare provider, so I'm kind of sitting back. I'll see if the healthcare providers have something to say first, and then I can kind of talk about burnout as a BIPOC mental health advocate, but they're they're different. Oh, please, no. Um, go ahead, Dr. Green. Uh, okay, well, I do want to acknowledge that they're different just in terms of, I guess, clinical capacity, right? But in terms of just an individual, like, especially thinking about this week in particular, right, and current events that are happening, like, what does it mean to be a Black person studying Black youth and families while Black youth are being shot at doorsteps? Um, it's real, right? And the burnout is real. And so I lean into the things that we've been talking about on this call and that I try to provide my youth and families with. I lean into radical hope. I lean into community. I lean into rest as resistance um, to ensure I'm okay. And then I lean into my work as resistance to keep going and know that like our ancestors kept going and we got here. And so I believe that we can get somewhere else. And so those things help me overcome burnout and then summer break is coming. So I also lean into rest. <laughs> um, as a researcher and clinician, I actually would say it's similar. Um, if we're talking about hearing the stories um, as I do with my patients, I, I have to make sure that I practice what I preach, surround myself with like-minded people who can support me. I think earlier it was said that every therapist has their own therapist who's not a family. So I do as, a, as well, um, though my therapist is my priest, um, friend, but um, I do have, I'm happy to say that over the years, I've been able to collect people who I can talk to about um, stuff, e either um, research stuff, academia stuff, or clinical stuff. And I think it's really important um, to acknowledge that it's not our job to just keep it all in. That's not healthy either, because um, then we're not practicing what we preach. So I would encourage folks to to find that network um, of, of of, of people um, that can um, support you. Uh, and the last thing that I would say, I, I go back to uh, cultural authenticity is being authentic to this uh, precise moment, even just with mindfulness, right? Knowing that perhaps uh, you're being true to yourself and entering into spaces that uh, allow you to do that, not so entering into spaces where you are, can be true to yourself, not where you're being told what truth even looks like for you. Uh, and that itself, because a, a part of even just like burnout can be just that is uh, not being in an opportunity to be able to be true to myself and being like, no, like it's okay to say no, or it's okay to be able just to regroup, recharge, refresh, and then continue on on this journey. And we know that um, physician burnout has a direct and indirect impact on patient health. So it is our ethical duty to, to make sure that we're keeping ourselves healthy. And I think every program should allow that, um, web, not within the program, but allow and give students resources to, to um, acknowledge that and take care of that. If not, then you talk to your program director, please. Okay, I think we have time for um, 
Uh, this question is for Dr. Hayes, pertaining to work involving care around weight and obesity in an industry and society that can be inherently fat phobic and at times anti-Black and misogynistic. In what ways does your work around weight and obesity consider the history and research around the topic? Oh, another small question. Oh. Um, okay, I'm trying to, um, what, what was the last part? What, in what ways has my work? Uh, to consider the history and research around the topic. Um, great question. Um, I think that, you know, anytime I have a conversation with someone around um, weight and obesity, I do have to, as a clinician, provide the advice to um, lower weight for health purposes to improve health. However, I do um, make it so I am very much patient centered. So if the patient does not want to do or that or is not ready to want to lose weight or um, do physical activity or whatever that means to help lose weight, then we're not going to proceed forward. It's always a collaborative approach uh, with folks. And, you know, we, we do, as I've said before, with tobacco, there are these social determinants of health, our structural and our po political policy, um, social environments that are going to contribute. Um, obesity is caused by obesogenic society. It's not just genetics itself, but um, acknowledging that um, and letting patients know that it's not this is not, we're not blaming you for the weight. This is a product of society. So I think um, saying that very clearly, um, normalizing the difficulties um, in the relationship, those are all very key things. And I'm, there's probably a lot more to say <laughs> to answer that, but that's what I can think of right now. Thanks for the question. Thank you. I think we're gonna have to um, call it a, a wrap now. Um, really, really wonderful and generative comments. Um, I think we got uh, some really um, generative frameworks for thinking through, well, what are the larger histories, dynamics, and structures that inform um, the topic itself? And then at the same time, how do we consider um, the consequences of those structures on individuals and communities? So that constant shuttling um, back and forth, I think was really, really helpful for, for all of us. And especially I hope for the students who are working on the modules. Um, so thanks everyone for um, coming today and thank you so much for the panelists. That was really, um, I, I love I love these panels. I learned so much about what colleagues are doing across the campus. And so that was really inspiring. Um, and talking about burnout, um, I do feel like I'm, I'm gonna leave with a little bit of radical hope here um, and with, 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 some, with, a, with a new framework of thinking about critical consciousness um, in ways that I hadn't thought about before. So I appreciate that. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.